To the fans, baseball is America's pastime and our national sport. At the professional level, the people leading the clubs from the front office know it's a complex, competitive, and high-stakes business. David Dombrowski, President, CEO, and General Manager of the Detroit Tigers, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. It's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television Midtown Detroit studio. I'm Larry Phobes. Growing up in Illinois, Dave Dombrowski was an avid baseball fan and began his college work at Cornell playing football. Thanks for being here, Dave. Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. You talked about wanting to be a general manager in baseball since the eighth grade. Why did you play football? Well, it was more circumstances growing up in the south side, south suburbs of Chicago. I played all sports. I played football, basketball, and baseball, and baseball was always my favorite. But, you know, growing up in those cold weather climates, there's, the baseball seasons aren't real long, and we didn't have a lot of summer baseball at that time. So I played football and did pretty well at it. was not a big-time player, so I ended up uh, playing some football and going to college to do so. Then you moved uh, to uh, Western Michigan University, took your business degree. While you're there, you wrote a thesis that really launched your career titled The General Manager, The Man in the Middle. What are they in the middle of? Well, it was interesting, and it really did launch my career, and Western really well, it helped me out in every respect. But it was a situation where when you looked at the general manager's position, and as it evolved through times, you're really talking about the ownership level so people that own the teams, and then the players, the on-field personnel. And so he was the person to me in the middle at that point, sort of the go-between individual, even though he was the boss of the people on the field, he was the conduit, the kind of the in-between person between the ownership and the people on the field. Now, as part of that thesis, you went and interviewed and talked to a bunch of general managers, including uh, the general manager of the Chicago White Sox. He gave you some advice about college and about starting your career. What did he tell you? Well, it was the best advice I probably ever received because Roland Heeman, who was the general manager of the White Sox at that time and longtime baseball individual and ended up uh, being a great friend and really my mentor, recommended to me at that time a couple of things. I was interviewing from the, my paper and he recommended to me that the best place to get a job was to attend the yearly winter meetings. And those take place every December, and all the major league and minor league clubs attend there. So if you're trying to get your foot in the door, that that was the best place to go. And secondly, he recommended to me that if he was going to tell me one area to focus in, that would be in accounting, to have an accounting type of background, to have a financial background, because entering the game at that point, of course, we're thinking back a long time ago, so we're thinking the mid-'70s at this time. Baseball was just starting to boom. Free agency was just starting. People have a hard time believing this, but when I first started with the White Sox, we didn't even have a budget. And one of my first responsibilities was to draw up a, bu a budget for the baseball into the operations. So when you go back a long time, things have changed so much. So for me, it was very fortuitous to be majoring in accounting because it helped me get my foot in the door and it actually helped me grow because it gave me so many more responsibilities as a youngster than you normally would have. Because just think about it, if you draw up a budget, every expense was crossing my desk and I had to look at it, I had to prove it, I had to categorize it and that was in addition to the other responsibilities that I had. So what was Roland's reaction when he walked into the winter meetings in Hawaii and there you were? 
Well, first of all, it was a long way to go, and I also, it was nice that it just so happened it was in Hawaii, which was in 1977, it was my senior year in college. And so I had saved my money and was always focused on, on t attending the winter meetings. But I remember the site, he was walking through the lobby in Hawaii in the hotel we were staying, and I remember going, Mr. Heeman, Mr. Heeman. And he looked at me and he says, geez, I, Dave Dombrowski? And I said, yes. He said, uh, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm trying to get a job uh, in baseball like you recommended. And he sat down, he talked to me, he was really surprised that I was there. And it just was coincidence because he said to me, he says, you know what, he says, I might have something for you. Meet me tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And I remember at the time, I'm thinking, well, a lot of people, they're telling you to meet them, and they don't show up at that particular time. And sure enough, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning led to my first interview, first talk with them, and then talked to them later in that day, and uh, led to my career in professional baseball. Some kind of lesson in there for future leaders about mm -hmm. seeking advice and then taking it when you get it, and for the mentors to actually follow through and deliver on their promise for help? Well, I think so. I think it's a, it's a key for me, too. For example, I know myself learning from that experience. Anytime I get a letter from an individual looking to find a job in professional baseball, and I get a bunch of them at this point, I always respond to them, always give them advice on how to try to enter the game. And during the winter meetings, if I can, it gets to be very busy, meet with some people during that time period. And I think it's also very important for youngsters to be in a position if they're writing something to you or they're told to do something and they're trying to get their foot in the door, usually the person that's giving you advice is giving you advice based upon experience. And if you have the ability to go ahead and try to pursue that, that is recommended to you, that I think it's something very important for them to do. So they offered you a job at the White Sox, and the number I keep reading about is $8,000 a year. <laughs> yes. At the same time, you received a non-baseball job for $1,000 a week and turned it down. For, well, you, for, <laughs> you, for you, where's the line between following the passion for the job and just following the money? Well, that's a great question. And uh, when you think back to the situation, my desires was always to get into professional baseball. I loved the game, played it, as I said, was always fascinated by trades and transactions and box scores and reading about the game. And of course, you never really have a feel of what the job entails when you're on the outside. But I think it's extremely important to pursue your dream. And when you're young, and when you have to think about it at times, sometimes if you're younger, you have freedom to pursue things that you don't have at an older age. I didn't have any other responsibilities. I was my own, I didn't have a family, didn't have any children. And so for me, it was important to pursue what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And I think when I talk to people, the one thing I always tell them with, when I go to schools and go to colleges, pursue your passion. And when you're young, pursue it. And eventually, if you pursue your passion and you're fortunate to attain that goal, most of the time, the finances will follow behind you. So I think it's extremely important to follow your passion. For me, it worked out and made $8,000 a year. I think when I figured it out, because I used to, people don't, wouldn't even believe the hours that I would work when I started. We had a very small front office. You'd be in the office by 8 o'clock in the morning after a night game. Bill Veck owned the team at that time, and Bill Veck, a, favorite, a famous owner in the Hall of Fame. A lot of times he'd stay very late at night, and it was my job to drive him home, and Roland Heeman didn't have a car, and I dropped Roland off. And a lot of times I wouldn't get back home when I lived with my parents at that time until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'd be back up in the office the next day. So I think I figured it out that my yearly rate at 8000 broke down to about a dollar an hour. Um, but uh, it was worth it because I loved what I was doing and eventually things uh, looked more bright for me, became more bright as far as uh, making more income was concerned. So things are booming well in Chicago, then there's a, a new, and you made assistant general manager by 25, the new general manager comes in, kind of a purge, and you're out. How hard is it to pick yourself up when this really perfect job kind of goes away? Well, that's a great question. That was really a very important part for me in my life because when I look back at it, I was with the White Sox. I was very young assistant general manager at that point uh, with Roland. And then when Roland got let go, one thing he told me, and I had thought of leaving the organization at that time. They brought in a new general manager. He didn't have any experience in that type of end of the operation. He was a broadcaster and ex-player. His name is Ken Harrelson. He's still a broadcaster with the White Sox organization. And Roland advised me, he said, Dave, I think it's extremely important for you to stay here. And he said, I'm going to tell you some reasons behind it. 
He said, first of all, you've worked for me since the beginning of your career. It's a good to get exposure from someone else, and it's just as important to learn on how to do things, which hopefully you've learned from me, and how not to do things as your career progresses. And he was very important and very, very important statement and, and right because I learned a lot of things on how not to handle things in the front office. And the second part of it is, is I think it's important. Now, different operations are viewed, different organizations are viewed in, in different ways, but in professional baseball, it's important to not walk out on a job. It's important to not quit. And so for me at that time, uh, getting let go from the White Sox organization, which sort of shattered me at the time. I remember I felt sorry for myself, oh, woe was me. But it was interesting because a lot of people at that time offered me advice. I was offered jobs by various individuals very quickly, and I decided to wait to uh, pursue some other things at that point, learn how to speak Spanish better, do some other things before I took a job with the Montreal Expos organization. And that really worked out well. You joined there and you were leading their minor league clubs. Four or five years later, or a few years later, you became general manager at Montreal at the top 31, at the time the youngest general manager in baseball. How does a young leader come in when you're basically the same age as the same generation of the players and probably younger than most of the front office and establish yourself as the real leader? Well, I was. I was 31, which was the youngest general manager ever at that time. And it was interesting because a lot of players were older than me. Uh, I would say I was sort of in the middle of the pack. But I think um, a couple of things. I think, first of all, you have the knowledge yourself. So hopefully you've accumulated the knowledge that you need. You have the background that you need. I had been in professional baseball for 10 years and exposed to a lot of different things at that time. So that was very important for me. And I think the other thing is, is that you need to make sure that you <clears throat> separate yourself, per se, from the players. You're not a friend. You're not a buddy. You get to know them, but you know that you're in a whole different job than what they are. So you get to know them, but by no means just because you're 31 and the same age and they're going out for dinner and going out to do various things, you're not going to the same places as they are. And when Montreal's <laughs> job, uh, you're, you're doing things are going very well there, <clears throat> then you get the offer which I think is a really cool offer, you get this call from Florida. Would you like to be general manager of the new team, Florida Marlins? And you got that job two years before the first game. When people are starting up a new traditional business, there's mission and vision and business plans and all that. Is there a counterpart when you're starting up a new ball club? Sure there is. And I think that uh, starting off having the background there is very important. Now, I was at that point just the general manager, so I wasn't the club president. So I was responsible for the baseball end of the operation and making sure that everything there was set up. But you had to have a plan. You had to know what your budget was, where you were going to go financially, how much revenue was going to be produced so you would know what your bottom line could be. You had to know what your ownership was, what their thought process was in that regard. You needed to set up your scouting department, your player development, your Latin American operations, your major league staff. So there were so many things that were involved in it. And it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And one of the things that I had always wanted to do in breaking into professional baseball was to have the opportunity to start an expansion team, something from the very beginning, which didn't come along very often. It hasn't come along very often after that. Now, <clears throat> it, obviously, it worked. Four, five years after starting the team, you took the series. Mm -hmm. The following year, there's a, there's a change in philosophy from the owners, thinking about selling. And I think the phrase you use there is a fire sale. How do you go about dismantling the winning team that you spent seven years putting together? Well, that was, a, that was a tough one, and that was one where you really need to dig down deep at that point because we won a world championship. We had started from the very beginning. We built it up, and within five years, we won the world championship. We had a great club, and we really had a foundation of young players to be good for a long, long time ownership changed the thought process there. They decided that they wanted to sell the team and they basically wanted to dismantle. And that was my responsibility to lead that. And <clears throat> after you feel sorry for yourself, after you feel, oh, woe is me, why are we doing this? I asked myself a couple of questions. And the one question was, okay, are you prepared to do this and try to rebuild it again? And I was young at that time, so I had a long future ahead of me. Or if you're not prepared to do it, you better step back, tell the owner that, and not take the responsibility of doing it because you're not going to head into it 
with the right approach. And nobody likes to do that, nobody wants to do it, but I thought it was important as a leader at that time, once I accepted that, to at least lead in the proper fashion and tell people, okay, we may not like doing this, but our goal is to build an organization that will be successful in the future, get the best young talent we possibly can. And you have to remember, the owner owns the team, it's his club. So he's, he's ultimately in charge and you work for him and you have to be able to accept that responsibility. Thanks for being here, Dave. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk with Dave Dombrowski, President, CEO, and General Manager of the Detroit Tigers, about leading our hometown team. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Dave Dombrowski, President, CEO, and General Manager of the Detroit Tigers. When you, when you left Florida, Dave, you were courted by several different teams, but you chose Detroit. Why? Well, it came down to, and I made the decision, but also my wife, uh, Carrie Ross, uh, was involved in that type of decision. I think you have to involve your family. And so, really, it came down to a couple of things. One is the Tigers were not an organization at that time that was doing real well. The other places were doing better. However, I thought it was always a great baseball city. People had talked about it being a sleeping giant, which I thought we could do very well. And then also, I think ultimately it came down to ownership, Mike Illich, the way he treated me at that time. He made me feel welcome. He empowered me in the sense that he felt that, okay, the responsibility will be yours. You'll work closely with me, give you that responsibility, and you were dealing with one individual that you know wanted to win, and his track history, when you look at his history with the Red Wings, was very successful, so you knew he was a winner, and he treated us very well, so it really came down to uh, that being the major factor. As you said, 2002 was, wasn't a real good season, 2003 was worse. So you're really into a corporate turnaround situation. How do you go about leading that big a turnaround as quickly as you ultimately did? Well, I think you need to get a pulse of everything that's taken place as quickly as possible, not necessarily rush into decisions. And you also have to be in a situation where you get people on board that you can trust that help you with your evaluations. Because realistically, you can't be everywhere at one time. And in baseball, it's a lot different because you have your baseball entity that's right there in Detroit, let's say. But some of our most important decision makers are scouts in different parts of the country that you're not with them day in and day out, people in Latin America that are evaluating young talent, your player development people that are working with your youngsters at the farm, in the farm system, and you're not there on a daily basis. So you have to have people that you trust and can depend upon their recommendations when you're turning something around. And so getting those people on board, people like Anal Avila, John Westoff, Scott Reed, people that I could trust very quickly that you knew they knew what they were doing and had a good pulse of what would be taking place helped me in addition to what was taking place at the big league level. Now a lot of those people that came in uh, you'd worked with before. So you, do you bring them in because it's a known business relationship, they know you and you know them, or is it also part of changing what you'd called a culture of losing by bringing in new people who have a different culture? Well, I think it's a combination, and I think, first of all, you don't bring in people just as friends because I think that that is a, a recipe for a disaster. But those three individuals I just named, for example, I never knew them until I worked with them, so it wasn't like we were longtime friends. Secondly, we had the need for those jobs in our organization, so we needed those people in those roles. And I also think, though, that you need to go into an organization with an open mind because you may be able to change the culture with the way you lead. And sometimes you have very good people within an organization that once you lead them differently and tell them what you would like them to be doing or how you're going to handle things, they may respond to that in a positive fashion. But unless you give them the opportunity you may lose good people and you don't want to do that. So I think getting to know your personnel very quickly, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and letting people know your philosophy is important as you turn, try to turn around a franchise. 
Now, things are a lot better today, right? Uh, you, the seasons are going very well. The tennis is rolling. How do you how do you keep the club from getting a little bit complacent with the success from your start and not slipping back? Well, I think that's really installed by your leadership, not only you, but your other leaders within the organization, because you're never satisfied. You can always be better. If you work hard, if you are driven to succeed, and people see that, complacency doesn't set in, and you can't allow it. Maybe you'll see somebody that all of a sudden will sit back and say, okay, but you can't really accept that as an organizational leader. You put good people in leadership jobs, you let them handle their responsibilities, and you have to make sure that they're individuals that are driven, that aren't going to allow that type of thought process to take place. And I think as long as you continue doing that, you can build upon the successes you have. You don't accept the success that you've had and just say that's it. You're in an interesting situation. As the general manager, you, you have people working, who are uh, reporting to you, including people like Jim Leyland, the field manager, who's expert in what he does. And you have an owner, Mike Illich, who's who's an entrepreneur turned businessman, great sports fan, but you each have different needs out of the business. How, how do you work across so that you can give Jim what he needs on the field to win, but make it a bottom line business that works for Mike? Well, that's a great question, and that's something we work on every single day. Uh, so that's something that there's just no recipe or formula to do that per se, but I think it's important. First of all, we have an owner in Mike Illich that wants to win, that understands sports, so it's extremely important. He was in the game in the he early days. He played um, in the minor leagues back in the 50s, and he really understands sports. He's willing to take a chance, too. He's not just bottom line, this is the way it is. He's focused on that, but he's also willing to take a chance to try to push success. And when you have a manager like Jim Leland, very successful manager, knows the game inside and out. You try to give him the best talent you possibly can. We work day in and day out in making the Tigers the best club that we possibly can and best organization. But being in our jobs, we know where our responsibilities ultimately start and stop. I mean, we work together, but when it comes to putting that lineup together on a daily basis, that's Jim Leland's responsibility. I, I don't tell him you need to play this guy, you need to play that guy. The day I start doing that would be the last day that Jim Leland managed because he'd say, forget it, I'm out of here. Um, that's my job. And it's just like we discuss it, but ultimately putting the players on the team, finding the players is my ultimate responsibility. But again, we work hand in hand in that. So you need to know where your responsibilities start and stop, who has the ultimate responsibility in some of the decisions. And really when it comes down to Mike Illich, it's, it's simple, he lets you do your job. But he's also the owner, so if he wants something, you'll, you'll uh, work with him and do him whatever he would like. Now, as you're doing your job, a baseball team, whether it's major league, minor league, or little league, is part of the community fabric. Your decisions are out there public. Everybody has an opinion. Does public opinion guide your leadership at all, or just ignore that? Well, I don't want to say you ignore it, because if something is really you get letters and if something is makes a lot of sense you try to pay attention to what is being said for example if you have a problem in your ballpark if you don't have proper service you don't offer proper food but um, you can't let them make the decision on your players you listen to them you understand why they're saying something and I think that's part of the the lure of the job that's part of the beauty of the sport everybody has an opinion on it but ultimately, you have to put together the club the way you feel is proper. Okay. I've got one last question for you, Dave. Your name often comes up in the media as being in contention for the next baseball commissioner when Mr. Selig retires. Instead of becoming baseball commissioner, let's assume you wake up tomorrow morning and you're the chairman of Little League International. How are you going to use your experiences running a pro club to introduce the game to children? Well. That's a, it's a good question. I think the reality of it is is that you understand the game. I have a son that plays Little League Baseball, so I'd have a little bit more. But I think that really what's important there is that you need to emphasize for youngsters that play baseball to have fun. Enjoy what you're doing. We can organize it, but let's make sure we create an atmosphere where people love what they're doing and have fun, 
and I try to create that type of atmosphere. Thanks for being here, Dave. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.